Welcome back kapatid once again to our ongoing series on Introduction to Persons and Family Relations. In our last lesson, we talked about Article 23 of the Civil Code as a continuation of the principle of unjust enrichment. Article 23 provides that even when an act or event causing damage to another's property was not due to the fault or negligence of the defendant, the latter shall be liable for indemnity if, through the act or event, he was benefited. For Article 23 to apply, the requisites are 1. There must be an act or event which causes damage. 2. The damage is caused upon another person's property. 3. The defendant must have been benefited from the act or event. 4. The defendant is still liable even if there is no fault or negligence on his part. When these four requisites are present, then the person is liable for indemnity. The basis of the indemnity is the degree to which he or she has been benefited. This is because Article 23 is a follow-up to the principle of unjust enrichment. The law makes a person liable for damages even if he had no participation in the act or event, so long as he or she gains some benefit therefrom. Today, we're taking a look at Article 24 of the Civil Code. Sa unang tingin, kapatid, ay parang naligaw ang provision na ito. Ang mga provisions kaya ng Articles 19 to 23, lahat yan ay mga causes of action or the reason or legal basis why we can come to court to ask for a relief or remedy. When you study this provision within the context of where it is placed, parang tama naman. Article 24 is part of the chapter on human relations. It's that part of the Civil Code that teaches us how we should behave towards one another in most aspects of our lives. However, there is one big difference. Article 24 is a directive addressed not to us but for the courts. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define 1. The principle of parents patriae. 2. Identify situations where it should apply. 3. Define a contract of adhesion and when it should or should not be nullified. All of this and more coming right up! Hi, my name is Lex and welcome to Lex in Motion. In this channel, I'll be helping you build your competence, confidence, and capability in law school. Start today by hitting the subscribe button below. New episodes are posted every Friday. Article 24 of the Civil Code provides that in all contractual property or other relations, when one of the parties is at a disadvantage, on account of his moral dependence, ignorance, indigence, mental weakness, tender age, or other handicap, the courts must be vigilant for his protection. This is a relatively short provision, kapatid, and with all honesty, hindi talaga ito tinatalakay sa persons and family relations. Itinuturing itong reading matter for things that you're expected to read on your own, to study on your own, and to a certain extent, something that's nice to know but not much use within the course. Hindi naman din ako papayag kapatid na palalampasin natin ang isang pagkakataon na madagdaga ng iyong kaalaman. Kahit hindi nyo ito i-discuss sa klase, I want you to be confident that you know and understand the reading matters within the law. I want you to be capable when these concepts are discussed later on in torts and damages and even in obligations and contracts. Article 24 of the Civil Code is not directed to us mere mortals. Kung papansinin ang last sentence ng batas na ito, isinasaad the courts must be vigilant for his protection. Article 24, in effect, kapag dita isang utos ng ating batas, inaatasan ng mga korte na maging maagap at masigasig sa pagbabantay ng ating mga karapatan, pero specifically, kaninong karapatan. Article 24 mentions sa class of or kinds of persons who need more protection from the courts. These people are those who suffer from moral dependence, ignorance, indigence, mental weakness, tender age, or some other handicap. Let's take a look at each of these persons and let's identify why they deserve more protection than say you and me. Moral dependence refers to the inherent imbalance in the relationship between two persons where one party needs the other more such that the dependent party has no choice but to submit to the will of the dominant or more powerful party, the imbalance typically stems from socio-economic reasons. 
madalas makikita ang moral dependence sa employer-employee relationship. In this situation, mas kailangan ng isang empleyado ang kanyang employer. Nakasalalay ang kabuhayan ng isang household helper, isang security guard o isang empleyado ng grocery sa kanika nilang mga boss, amo o agency. May mga pagkakataon na sila ay inuutusan ng mga bagay na ayaw naman nilang gawin, labag sa kanilang kalooban o umuoo na lang sila. Dahil ayaw nilang mawalan ng trabaho, ng kabuhayan at maraming nakaasa sa kanila. This kapatid is moral dependence. The law has a strong bias in favor of the employee and against the employer. No less than the Constitution tells us that. This is because the Supreme Court teaches us that a person's job is his property, sometimes only property. Kung tutuusin maraming maraming Pilipino ang walang wala sa buhay at tanging kanilang mga trabaho ang maituturing nilang property. Based on moral dependence, labor has to be accorded more protection particularly against the possible abuses of management. In practical terms, when there are doubts between the construction of labor laws or to a certain extent, in the evaluation of the pieces of evidence, these doubts have to be resolved in favor of labor, in favor of the employee, and against management, against the employer. The employer occupies the economic high ground. Pwedeng-pwede niya kasing sisantahin ng kanyang tao. Marami diyang gustong mamasukan at madali lang palitan ng isang empleyado. When this happens, the employee has practically no other remedy, no other recourse but to come to court. It's only when the employee asserts his or her rights, thus the protection kick in. This is the essence of moral dependence. Ignorance, on the other hand, is a function of the degree of instruction or education that one person has. The law will tilt in favor of someone who has not finished primary or elementary education versus someone who has finished a college degree or is part of a professional board. However, kapatid, it is wrong to assume that the bias always kicks in just because one party has proven that he cannot read or write. Kung may isang high school dropout ang namaril ng isang nurse o doktor, ay papanigan na ba agad ng batas ang high school dropout by virtue of ignorance? No, kapatid, it does not work that way. Article 24 provides that it applies in contractual property or other relations. It has no bearing in the commission of crimes. A lot would depend on the factual circumstances surrounding each case. May mga pagkakataon na, kapatid, kung saan pinawalan ng bisa ng mga korte ang mga kasunduan sa pagbili ng lupa, sa pagitan ng mga magsasaka na hindi marunong sumulat at bumasa at mga titulado o edukadong tao kung mapapatunayan na may lokohan na na nangyari. For the same reason, the degree of instruction and the amount of education a person has has been placed not as a justifying or mitigating circumstance under the revised penal code. Instead, We find it under alternative circumstance. If a person has used his knowledge, training, and education to commit the crime of estafa, then that should be taken against him. If because of the limited education of a person, he has committed the crime, then that can also be possibly used to mitigate his criminal liability. Indigence refers to the state of relative poverty. Sa ilalim ng Article 24, inaatasan ng ating mga korte na maging mapagmasid sa mga karapatan ng ating mga kababayan na naghihirap sa buhay. The law offers plenty of protection for the poor and you also see that in the rules of court. When you come to court, kapatid, and file a complaint against another person, you are required to pay docket fees, filing fees, and other fees. Nagbabayad tayo ng mga ganitong fees para sa band paper na gagamitin para sa mga summons o ibang order ng court. Nagbabayad tayo nito para sa printer, kuryente, internet, at iba pang mga gastusin ng korte para sa ating complaint. Nagbabayad din tayo para sa oras ng sheriff, court interpreter, at ibang empleyado ng judiciary. Mahal ang filing fees, and I want to discuss more about this on our series on civil procedure. For now, let me share with you the meaning of indigence in relation to our remedial laws. A person who comes to court has to pay the necessary docket fees and other lawful fees. That's the general rule. The exception is when an indigent comes to court to file a complaint. Rule 141 of the Rules of Court provides that a person is an indigent or pauper litigant 
when the combined gross monthly income of himself and his immediate family do not amount to double the minimum wage. Ang pangalawang condition, and I feel this is the more important condition, is that a person must not own real property whose fair market value exceeds 300,000 pesos. Kung pasok sa dalawang requisites, kapatid, itinuturing ng batas na indigent ang isang tao, hindi siya magbabayad ng docket fees. Pero kung siya ay mananalo sa kanyang complaint, iaawas muna ang dapat niyang binayaran bago ibigay sa kanya kung ano man ang i-award ng court. On the other hand, karaniwang makikita ang mental weakness sa mga kaso kung saan ang isang lola ay nagpapahiram ng titulo sa kanyang anak o apo. Pero ito ay hindi ilang isinasanla kundi ibinebenta. Mental weakness is a condition of the mind. It typically presents itself in persons with advanced age. suffering from some mental illness or both. Mental weakness is something that courts must watch out for, particularly when the parties to a contract are of an advanced age or in the allowance or disallowance of a will, as executed by the person who may have been unduly influenced by a family member, friend, or caregiver. In a very, very old case decided by the Supreme Court in 1912, the court has had occasion to rule on mental weakness. Sa kasong ito, kapatid, ay may challenge sa isang will. The will in this case, named Juliana Bagtas as the executrix of the will of Pio V Pagyo. The will was later challenged by Isidro Pagyo, isa sa mga anak ni Pio V from a prior marriage. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the mere fact that a person was advanced in age does not necessarily mean he has lost the capacity to make a will. Kadalasan sa ating pagtanda, doon lang natin naiisip na gumawa ng will. Inilaban ni Isidro na mahina na ang kanyang tatay at marami siyang sakit na paralisado na ang kaliwang bahagi ng kanyang katawan at meron siyang mental weakness kaya dapat mapawalan ng bisa ang kanyang will. To this, the Supreme Court ruled that perfect soundness of mind is not essential to testamentary capacity. A testator may be afflicted with a variety of mental weaknesses, disorders, or peculiarities and still be capable in law of executing a valid will. It is not necessary that the mind shall be wholly unbroken, unimpaired, or unshattered by disease, or otherwise, or that the testator should be in the full possession of his reasoning faculties. Finally, we have tender age. The law has always shown a bias in favor of minors, no matter their position relative to the law. A contract of sale executed by a minor may nevertheless be declared void. A contract of loan made by a minor can be voided on the basis of his or her minority. When a minor is called as a witness to court, the law confers a lot of protection upon the minor. They may be called and examined not necessarily in open court but behind closed doors. A child witness has the right to be accompanied by a trusted adult or caregiver. Courts have to make every single accommodation possible to keep the child witness comfortable during the examination. The protection of children is so great, so wide, that minors who may have committed crimes are not denominated as accused. They are called children in conflict with the law and their cases are handled specifically by court personnel who have undergone special training for this purpose. Why does the law afford protection for those who are morally dependent? For senior citizens or for minors, ano ang basis nito? Article 24 and the host of other laws are based on the principle of parents patriae. This is a doctrine you will encounter in constitutional law, administrative law, taxation, and other subjects. Parents patriae means parent of his or her country and refers to the state in its role as a sovereign or the state in its capacity as a provider of protection to those unable to care for themselves. In fulfilling this duty, the state may resort to the exercise of its inherent powers, police power, eminent domain, and power of taxation. Ibig sabihin kapatid ang estado ang tumatayong ating magulang alang-alang sa mga taong hindi kayang protektahan ng kanilang mga sarili. Ang parents patrie ay tinuturing na auto-team balance para sa ating lipunan na kung hindi kikilos ang gobyerno para sa kapakanan ng mga mahihirap, mga matatanda, mga bata at mga taong may mga kapansanan, 
ay hindi magpapantay ang ating lipunang ginagalawan. Parents patrie is a role that the government takes in order to somewhat balance the inherent inequality of different persons within the state. Under this doctrine, the government is justified to use the three powers, police power, eminent domain, and the power of taxation in order to afford protection against potential abuses to those who are morally dependent, mentally weak, or those who are of a very tender age. For example, the Senior Citizens Law or the law that grants discounts for senior citizens for their purchase of food, medicines, and other health services is based on the doctrine of parents patrie. Ang mga senior citizen kapatid one sa panatay ay mga malalakas, malulusog, at kapaki-pakinabang na miyembro ng ating lipunan. Ibinigay nila ang kanilang lakas at panahon para umandar ang ekonomiya. At bilang ganti at least sa kanilang pagtanda ay sila sana ay mabigyan ng kaunting pabuya o konswelo mula sa bansang kanilang pinaglingkuran. Sa parehong paraan kapatid sa ilalim ng Magna Carta for Disabled Persons, an imperfect law but still a good law affords the same protection for people who have suffered or were born with different abilities or as the law calls it, handicaps. The basis of the law is the doctrine of parents patrie. The goal here is for the state to somewhat balance their situation and to help them with their integration with society. For children, we have a lot of laws. I've already mentioned the rules on child witnesses and children in conflict with the law. There are portions under the Violence Against Women and Children Act that pertain to the protection of children in our society. And I hope to discuss more of this in our series for criminal law and other special penal laws. For now, let's look at the cases under Article 24 of the Civil Code. In Teresita Dio v. St. Ferdinand Memorial Park, Incorporated, Teresita Dio is a well-known businesswoman from Lucena City. She purchased from St. Ferdinand Memorial Park a parcel of land about 36 meters. This parcel of land was used as the final resting site for Teresita's father and husband. When her daughter died, she also buried her daughter on the same lot. Sometime in 1986, she decided to build a mausoleum on the land she had purchased. She had the design made and the possible cost of the mausoleum was 60,000 pesos. St. Ferdinand Memorial Park was duly informed of this plan. Teresita's plan was approved but the SFMPI pointed to Rule 69 of their contract that any plans for the construction of buildings, improvements, or memorials have to conform to the standards of SFMPI. Further, lot owners are prohibited from engaging outside contractors. Rule 69 of their contract provides that only SFMPI may build mausoleums, improvements, and memorials. Sinabihan si Teresita na based sa kanyang design, ang total cost ay 100,000 pesos. For context, kapatid, this was in the 1980s. Malaki ang value noon ng 40,000 pesos na dagdag singil kay Teresita. Teresita challenged the rule before the Regional Trial Court of Lucena City. She argued that the rule was added much, much later than her purchase date in 1973. For St. Ferdinand Memorial Park, they argued that Rule 69 was part of the original agreement, that it was made in good faith, and the 100,000 pesos was not oppressive, unconscionable, na sapat lang ang kanilang sinisingil, batay sa design at presyo ng mga materyales. The Regional Trial Court ruled in favor of the Memorial Park. It rejected the claim of Teresita that she was not informed of Rule 69 at the time she purchased the memorial lot. The fact that she reached out to the memorial park to have her design approved was evidence that she was aware of Rule 69. The Court of Appeals for its part affirmed the ruling of the Regional Trial Court. The Appellate Court ruled that the Resita agreed with the terms of their contract and to any future rules governing the cemetery. In this case, the Supreme Court applied two principles. Article 24 of the Civil Code and the Doctrine of Contract of Adhesion. The Supreme Court did not apply Article 24 of the Civil Code. It ruled that Teresita Dio is an experienced businesswoman. She doubtlessly dealt with numerous documents and is therefore presumed to know the import thereof. It cannot be further emphasized that it behooves every contracting party to learn and know the contents of an instrument before signing and agreeing to it. Sa kasong ito, hindi nakita ng Supreme Court bilang isa sa mga taong nangangailangan ng proteksyon sa ilalim ng ating batas. 
si Teresita Dio. Hindi siya morally dependent sa Memorial Park. Hindi siya ignorante, naghihirap sa buhay. Wala rin katibayan na siya ay may mental weakness o kapansanan. Aware siya sa kanyang pinirmahang kontrata at dahil dyan, dapat siyang sumunod sa kanilang Rule 69. In this case, the Supreme Court also teaches us about contracts of adhesion. A contract of adhesion is one wherein one party imposes a ready-made form of contract on the other. It is not strictly against the law. A contract of adhesion is as binding as ordinary contracts. The reason being that the party who adheres to the contract is free to reject it entirely. Makikita ang contract of adhesion sa mga terms of service na ating inaagrihan. Sa tuwing tayo ay mag install ng bagong software. Contract of adhesion din kadalasan ng contract of carriage sa mga barko at eroplano. These contracts are prepared ahead of time by one of the parties. Wala naman tayong choice kundi pumirma o hindi pumirma. Sa kaso ni Teresita, ang kasunduan ng kanyang pagbili ng libingan ay nakatype na. Ang kailangan na lang ay pumirma siya. Contract of adhesion silang tinatawag dahil walang room for a negotiation. Yes or no lang ang sagot ng isang party. Our choice is to adhere to the contract or to reject it in its entirety. It bears stressing that a contract of adhesion is just as binding as ordinary contracts. It is true that we have on occasion, sabi ng Supreme Court, struck down such contracts as void when the weaker party is imposed upon in dealing with the dominant bargaining party. And this reduced to the alternative of taking it or leaving it, completely deprived of the opportunity to bargain on equal footing. Nevertheless, contracts of adhesion are not invalid per se. They are not entirely prohibited. The one who adheres to the contract is in reality free to reject it entirely. If he adheres, he gives his consent. In this case, however, there is no reason for the court to apply the rule on stringent treatment towards contracts of adhesion. To reiterate, not only is petitioner educated, she is likewise a well-known and experienced businesswoman. Thus, she cannot claim to be the weaker or disadvantaged party. in the subject contract so as to call for a strict interpretation against the memorial park. Next case I'd like to share with you, kapatid, is the case of the spouses Vicente and Lalaine Cabanting versus BPI Family Savings Bank. Noong January 2003, bumili si Vicente at ang kanyang asawa na si Lalaine ng isang 2002 Mitsubishi Adventure SS Manual Transmission. Binili nila ito sa halagang 836,032 pesos Mula sa Mitsubishi, installment ang laban ng mag-asawa at dahil dito gumawa sila ng promissory note kung saan isinanla ng mag-asawa ang kanilang bagong biling adventure. Standard naman ang ganitong shuttle mortgage sa mga bilihan ng kotse na installment. One of the provisions of the promissory note is that in the event that the maker of the note fails to pay when the installment is due and payable, then the entire obligation shall become immediately due and demandable. No other notice or demand is necessary to collect the full amount. Ang tawag sa ganitong provision kapatid ay acceleration clause. On the date of the execution of the promissory note and shuttle mortgage, Diamond Motors Corporation executed a deed of assignment in favor of BPI Family Savings Bank, where BPI became the holder of all the rights, title, or any interest over the promissory note and the shuttle mortgage. This kapatid is the nature of bank financing in the purchase of motor vehicles on installment basis. The dealer of the automobile makes money from the purchase of one of its vehicles doon palang kumita na siya. The bank or financial institution takes the risk of collection but also enjoys the rewards of the transaction. In most cases, that's the huge interest of the car loan. About 10 months from the purchase of the adventure, the spouses We're unable to pay. Again, I am oversimplifying the facts here. BPI Family Bank filed an action to recover the vehicle and for the court to order the spouses to pay the unpaid balance thereon. In their defense, the spouses kabanting argued that they have already sold the vehicle na ibenta na po namin sa ibang tao who was assuming the balance but that this person failed to pay. The Regional Trial Court of Manila ruled in favor of BPI Family Savings Bank. Partly because the spouses had waived their right to present their evidence. 
The Court of Appeals affirmed the ruling of the Regional Trial Court but deleted the award of 20,000 pesos as attorney's fees. The Supreme Court, speaking through then Associate Justice Josdado Peralta, ruled in favor of BPI Family Savings Bank. He reiterated the ruling in Teresita Dio v. St. Ferdinand Memorial Park. The validity or enforceability of the impugned contracts will have to be determined by the peculiar circumstances obtaining in each case and the situation of the parties concerned. Indeed, Article 24 of the Civil Code provides that in all contractual property or other relations, when one of the parties is at a disadvantage on account of his moral dependence, ignorance, indigence, mental weakness, tender age, or other handicap, the courts must be vigilant for his protection. Here, there is no proof that the spouses were disadvantaged, uneducated, or utterly inexperienced in dealing with financial institutions. Thus, there is no reason for the court to step in and protect the interest of the supposed weaker party. In this case, the court ruled that the promissory note executed by the spouses was a contract of adhesion. A contract of adhesion is not invalid just because one of the parties exclusively prepared the contract ahead of time. The other party, in fact, has the choice either to agree to or adhere to the terms of the contract or to reject it completely. One more point about contracts of adhesion before we end tonight's lesson. And you will learn more about this during the second semester of your first year in obligations and contracts and again in torts and damages. When the terms of a contract of adhesion are not clear, any doubts on the contract shall be resolved against the party who prepared it. Ibig sabihin kapatid kung may malabong parts ng contract of adhesion ang bias ng batas ay patungo sa taong pumirma lang at laban sa taong naghanda at nagpapapirma na lang ng kontrata. To summarize tonight's lesson number one, Article 24 is a dormant power. It is only activated when the weaker party comes to court. It is only then that the protection begins. Three, the law protects those who suffer from moral dependence, ignorance, indigence, mental weakness, tender age, or other handicap. Four, the basis of this protection is the doctrine of parents patriae. This principle means that the state acting as the sovereign must step in to afford protection to those who need it. 5. A contract of adhesion is one where the contract is prepared exclusively by one party and the other party has nothing else to do but to accept or reject it. 6. A contract of adhesion is not invalid per se. A lot would depend on the peculiar circumstances of the contract. All doubts, however, are construed against the party who prepared the same and in favor of the party who merely signs it. Maraming salamat kapatid kung inabot mo ang ending ng episode na ito. Sana ay may natutunan ka sa lesson na ito. Magkakaalaman naman tayo mamaya sa quiz. I hope you post your scores. If you would like us to continue with these lessons, please let me know by typing yes in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. Like and share this video for Good Law School Carmine. I will see you next Friday.